Welcome. In this video, we will discuss the weak field Zeeman effect, which is simply the Zeeman effect in the case where we have a weak magnetic field. All right. And why is this important? As we mentioned, we have to use different methods for different magnitudes of the magnetic field. And in this first case, we will assume that the Hamiltonian that arises from the Zeeman effect is going to be, so the Hamiltonian from the Zeeman effect, we will assume to be much smaller than the one that we previously saw for the fine structure. And why is this important? Because this means that we can then treat the Zeeman Hamiltonian as a perturbation to our hydrogen atom system. All right, that's what, what we will do. And how exactly will we proceed? Well, what we used to do when we were dealing with perturbation theory is, well, first we need to know, is this degenerate, is this non-degenerate? Well, unfortunately for us, the hydrogen atom is highly degenerate. So we have to use degenerate perturbation theory. And that meant that we needed to find this horrible, horrible matrix, this W matrix. Um, but if we can use some clever tricks, however, we can avoid them. So we want to find, hopefully, you know, some states that can commute with the Hamiltonian and that will hopefully, hopefully, you know, that, 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 that will actually um, let us avoid using the matrix. I mean, we, we actually use the matrix too, because what we did in this matrix was to diagonalize it and we ended up only with states right here, right? And those states are precisely those that have the good, that are the good state. So if can, we can find them kind of, you know, just by being smart, we can avoid quite a li little bit of trouble. And what we can now see is that, all right, so this is the perturbation. Then we can base our states on the one that we used in the case for the spin orbit coupling, which was also this coupling with a magnetic field. And what we did back then is that instead of using L and S, we used J, which was the total angular momentum. So J, which is L plus S, because unfortunately, neither L nor S are separately conserved if we are in the presence of this external magnetic field. And the good thing is that J is indeed con uh, conserved. And what, we, what you can see here, um, you can find that by taking the, uh, the, com the commutators with the Hamiltonian, if you want to check that. And so J is good, the other ones not so good. Um, we already discussed this briefly, or maybe more than this, uh, in the video for the spin orbit coupling. So that's why I'm going a bit faster here. And since I mean, L and S don't commute, but something that we have also seen is that L squared and S squared, and, and well, of course, J squared too, since J also commutes, um, all three of these do commute. So they are indeed good states, right? So if they commute, then they are good states, right? We discussed this in the previous video. If you're unsure um, how we get to this conclusion, uh, do check that out. All right. So now that we know that these are good states, we need to get rid of the bad states, which are these L and S. So let's simply rewrite them. So we, this is basically L plus S and then plus S again. So we can get rid of L plus S by writing J instead, right? So maybe let's blah, blah, blah. All right. So E over to M and then we have J plus S. Okay. So we have made progress, but we still have this annoying S, right? That is not a good state. So we need to get rid of it. Um, what could we do? Well, S is going to be changing its value constantly, but we know that J is good. So what we could try and find is to find the average value for S or rather the projection of S in the direction of J. And how could we find that? How can we find the projection of a vector in the direction of another? Well, to do that, there is a, a formula that you might have seen in maybe in like linear algebra or in mathematical methods or something. Um, if you don't remember, remember it, there is a nice trick to, to do so. And it is the following, all right? This is not like super rigorous mathematically, but it works and it really helps me out. So if we want to find the projection of S in the J direction, we can take S dot J, right? 
Um, the problem is that this will give us simply a number, right? And we still want to include the fact that it is a vector. So because we started out with s, we, we, which is a vector here, we can't just end up with a number which is not a vector. So let's multiply by j again. The problem here though is that we now have two of the magnitudes of j, right? So we have, this is not only the direction j, this is also the magnitude because j of course is some magnitude times the direction. So we have two of these magnitudes that are being annoying here. One from this, one from this. So we can divide by j squared, j being the magnitude of course, and that would solve our problem. So this right here is the formula for the projection of s in the j direction. And that is exactly what we will plug into our Hamiltonian. Um, so let's do that. I will move some of my things there. Well, whoops, that's not at all what, what I thought was going to happen um, there. And let's get rid of s. So instead of s, we will have s dot j divided by j squared. And this is also times j. All right. So this is the formula for our Hamiltonian in this case. Okay, so this is the weak field uh, Z Zeeman effect Hamiltonian. Now we are finally in a position to begin looking for the energy levels. So how can we find the energy levels? Well, what we have here are the good states. So the energy levels of this Hamiltonian will be the expectation value of the Hamiltonian. So let's calculate that. So the expectation value, uh, the, the expectation value of the Hamiltonian is going to be the energy or the energy levels. So let's find that. This is of course the correction, right? Um, but we can may maybe just keep in mind that it is the correction or otherwise, I don't know, right? Like Z or something to make sure that you know what we are talking about. Um, okay, so we want the expectation value of this. Now I'm gonna go step by step. So expectation value of E over two M J plus S dot J J squared dot J. <laughs> Uh, that be all right. So now we can actually separate this into the different parts. So we can get well, of course, e over two m. We can simply pull out, and we can now say, all right, let's just choose uh, our direction, or we, we can choose to align our magnetic field in the z direction, for example, just in any particular direction. And in that direction, our b is going to be um, b. BXT, right? External magnetic field, but it's simply a name, call it B0, call it whatever. This is simply the magnitude of the magnetic field times, I don't know, Z direction, right? Which would actually be the direction, of course, of J. So we are simply choosing our J direction in the direction of the magnetic field. And wait, why is this a 2 and not an E? Wait, what? All right. Okay, so Having chosen this, we now proceed to finding the expectation values. So we can take the expectation value of what is inside and maybe to do that, it would be easier to factor out J. I mean, it doesn't really matter too much, but I think it's going to make it a bit uh, like less, uh, there's gonna be less stuff written and that's good. So let's factor out J to the right. So we get one, then we have plus S dot J over j squared and all of this multiplied by j dot b and we can of course uh, now take these in the in the same direction right um there we go all right so let's now do the actual computing of each one of these so the expectation value of what is inside here we have already seen before right actually maybe get rid of that. So we already know what those expectation values are. So one, of course, you know, it's one, but S dot J, what is that? So maybe let's go to a new page. So what is the expectation value of S dot J? Well, we don't really know it just like that, but we have actually encountered this sort of problem before. So what we did, and this is the usual trick is to say, well, where can we find something of the, of the form S dot J? And the answer is that if we have something like j squared plus or minus s squared, then, or sorry, the, we have to square the sum of, so basically j plus or minus s and that squared, 
If we had that, then we would get j squared plus or minus two times j dot s or s dot j, it's the same, um, plus s squared. So we have to find some place where something like this can arise. And the place where that comes from is actually the definition of j. So we know that j is l plus s. So if we subtract s, we get that j minus s is equal to l. So we can actually square both sides and we get j minus s squared is equal to l squared or rather j squared minus two. I'm gonna write it as s dot j just to make sure that we recognize what it is. Um, plus s squared is equal to l squared. And finally, we can now uh, find this value. So let's add it to this side, subtract l squared and divide by two. So we get that s dot j, um, this is going to be j squared minus l squared plus s squared divided by two. All right, so that is what we will have to find the expectation value of. And what is the expectation value of this, right? So what is the expectation value of this? Well, what is the expectation value of each one of these things? So what is the expectation value of j squared, for example? Well, that is something we have seen before. That would be h bar squared times small j, j plus one, right? The quantum number, j. And what about L? So expectation value of L squared, this would be the same actually, h bar L, L plus one. And then we have expectation value of S squared. Well, in this case, it is also that way, h bar S, S plus one. There is a small difference though here because we actually know what S is because unlike L and J, S has a fixed value, right? So we are dealing with electrons. So what we have here is S equal one half. So this is actually, uh, this is one half plus one, which is three over two times one half. So it's three over four. So these are the values we have. So this means that the expectation value is going to be h bar squared factor of j, j plus one minus l, l plus one plus three over four divided by two, right? So that is this expectation value. And this is something we will then plug in to what we found before. All right, so we will plug it in right here. So we get h bar squared j, j plus one minus l, l plus one plus three over four. And this is divided by the expectation value of j squared. And, and this is has of course a, a two down here. And then this is multiplied by the expectation value of j squared. But we already know that, right? This is simply j, j plus one. All right. Um, and then we still have to deal with this expectation value of j dot b. So since they are going in the ball in the same direction, then the, that is simply going to be the dot product will be j. So not j vector, but j magnitude times b magnitude. So it's going to be b external. But what is, well, b, this is simply a constant, right? The magnetic field we can simply take out. So I don't know, like put it here or something, b external. And what is the expectation value of j, not j squared, be careful. Oh, by the way, I missed this h bar squared, sorry. Um, all right, um, so this is going to be j, not j squared. So what is the expectation value of it? Well, we have also seen that in the past. Um, that is going to be h bar times mj, right? The quantum number mj. Not Spider-Man's girlfriend, just a quantum number. <laughs> Sorry, I was at the movies. All right. <laughs> um, so this is our result, actually. But as you can see, there is like a lot of writing here. So we can actually simplify this a little bit. And the way to do that is to copy this and go to the next page. Wait a minute. I don't want to take that with me. There we go. So let's put it there. And just as a reminder, this is the new energy levels. Okay, um, so these are the new energy levels because of the Zeeman effect. And we can now rewrite this a little bit. So this H we will write here. And we will now define H bar 
e divided by 2m, this is what is actually called the Bohr magneton, and it is defined as mu b. So this is the Bohr magneton. All right, magneton because it is this part that is associated with the magnetic dipole moment. So magnet by magnetic moment magneton. That's where it comes from. And this piece right here is the the G Landay factor. All right, uh, and we usually call it J sub uh, sorry G sub J right because it depends on J. Also on L, but usually you you if you know J, you can also know L. And you could, I guess you could write J L, but usually we write just that. And of course, M has two possible values. It can be plus or minus. Um, so you have to take that in mind. So the energy levels then are going to be um, the Bohr magneton, Jg, the Landet factor, then we have Mj, and the external field. So these are the energy levels. And of course, the exact values will depend on what level we are looking at and what the exact field is and stuff. But this is the formula, right? So we will in a future video do a few examples of this so that you can learn to use it. But this is the energy levels for the weak field Zeeman effect. So I hope this was useful. If it was, please leave a like on the comment and subscribe. It doesn't cost you anything, but it really helps me out a lot. I'll see you in the next video. Thank you very much for watching.